You know, I was reading about this SARS and all the accusations against the SARS. Uh, a number of things that you'd hear, for example, someone, uh, like you're saying, walking down the street and then you're stopped by these police officers and they say, let's see your phone. They take your phone and they order you to open the mobile banking app. <laughs> and they go into the mobile app banking app and say, okay, so transfer this amount of money. Mm -hmm. Or some, sometimes they even commandeer someone into an ATM and say withdraw. So basically they became robbers. They were thugs. They were, they were thugs. thugs. They were thugs. I Stop mean. a young man who's just carrying a laptop bag. Oh, so you're the ones who feel that you're so intelligent, right? Yeah, you're you're the cream, the top of of our community. Bring that laptop. Mm. They take the laptop. These are the uh, you know complaints and counter complaints that you've heard about this particular unit of the police. Over because they have the mandate, their job is to go and crack down on crime. There was a rise in crime. And then they were set up to go and deal with it. And to deal with it, they don't discriminate. Did they actually do what they were supposed to do at some point? In the very beginning. In the very beginning, and there was kind of like a sigh of relief. And we're talking about 10 or so odd years ago. And there was a bit of a sigh of relief. So that this community vigilante that we talked about then didn't need to operate anymore. Because it would be that the government was doing what they were supposed to do when it came to the protection of its people. But then things began to change. Like I said, they got to a place whereby it was a, a lord and master and ruler of everybody. And they could do essentially mm. what they wanted. You know, and um, even hearing from, I mean, not to, not, let, let's not get it wrong here. Um, I mean, and, and as we'll hear as we continue with this conversation, and the president of the country yesterday said very many times, publicly and through his, uh, through his media handles, and said, you know what, the vast majority of the police force in this country are men and women who are dedicated to protecting the general population of the country. That's fine. Well and good. Hmm. However, it's not the vast majority that you have an issue with. It's a select, even within the SARS itself, it's not everybody who was a SARS officer who went rogue or who went brutal, right? Hmm. It was, it's a select few that have taken this responsibility or taken this opportunity or this position and decided to abuse it. And that's the problem. It's not the masses that you have a problem with. It's the few individuals who take power into their own hands and use it in a wrong manner. That's the problem. You know what is actually particularly strange is that any regime, no matter how m often and how much they, they claim to be democratic, mm. if you have within your ranks or the ranks of the security forces a unit such as this one mm. who are a law unto themselves, you will be viewed in only one light, that you are a repressive regime. And people will not believe that those people are acting on their own. They'll believe that these are people who have actually been authorized to terrorize the citizenry yeah. by those in power. Yeah. Even if it is them who have decided among themselves. But what I find disturbing is, before it gets to the point where the entire nation is up in arms, surely... What prevented those in authority from doing something about it from the very beginning? Because... There was noise, there were, there were complaints. By the time the citizens really get to the point where they feel, no, we're going to take matters in our own hands. Mm. How far and how long has this thing actually lasted before they actually get to that point? Mm. Well, we're going to go into some insights for this today. And um, there's been a lot that's been said. There's, there's been a lot um, that has been talked about. Like we said, the protests that have been going on for a very long period of time. But today we're going to have a chat with um, Mr. Bulama Bukarti, who is a human rights lawyer and lecturer at the Faculty of Law at Bayero University in Kano, Nigeria. And he joins us this morning to be able to open this up a little bit and to say what really is going on. And now this decision by the federal government yesterday to dissolve this unit how far reaching it is in terms of um, steps in the right direction, in terms of progress, and really does it mean anything in this fight? Um, Bulama, good morning uh, to you from Nairobi. Um, this is Ndu in the studio this morning with Siti Muga and Eric Latif. As we look at what has been going on with SARS over the last few weeks and the decision that was made yesterday um, by the government to dissolve it. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Ndu and the team. Uh, good morning, Nairobi. <laughs> it's good to have you, son. Thank you very much for joining us and speaking to us uh, on this particular matter. So just, we yes. try to get a background of what is it that has been happening with SARS and the protests nationally. But you can just maybe give us that background from the ground, how things have been in the last one week or two weeks 
uh, after the lead up to yesterday's announcement that this SARS unit has now been disbanded? Yeah, so um, just a bit of a background uh, for the sake of those who don't know SARS. Uh, its full meaning is Special anti robbery Squad, and it is a unit of the Nigeria Police Force that was originally set up to fight armed robbery in Nigeria. But over the years, uh, this unit turned themselves into state-sponsored armed robbers, mm -hmm. state-sponsored kidnappers, and, uh, 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 I mean, uh, state-sponsored murderers, or if you like, terrorists uh, uh, against the Nigerian people. Mm -hmm. They have been killing Nigerians, innocent Nigerians, for no offense. They have been doubling into matters uh, in which they should have no say or no party or no authority by law. And so what you saw in the last one week was a culmination of years of anger and outcry and impunity uh, that Nigerian youth felt enough was enough. And therefore, we poured out on the street across Nigeria, but also all over the globe, in London, in Washington, in other capitals of the world, to tell the Nigerian government that we have had enough of this uh, state-sponsored uh, terrorist group, we have had enough of these state-sponsored thieves and kidnappers and armed robbers, and that we want them gone. And that, uh, I mean, happened because SARS has, I mean, brutalized so many Nigerians that no Nigerian is just hearing about, about SARS theoretically. Mm. All of us have felt their impact. It's either you have been affected personally or someone you know, your friend, your family or neighbor has been affected personally. It is either you, you have been killed or someone you know, a, a member of your family has been killed or extorted or detained illegally. And therefore, no Nigerian needed any convincing to come out on, uh, on the street. And what you saw, many of the Nigerians that came out on the street this time around had never protested in their lives. This is the first time they are protesting, and that's because we have had this, enough of uh, this terrorism. Hmm. Was it, uh, when you say the state-sponsored robbers, kidnappers and all, was it individual members of this unit who went rogue and they misused their power, or do you feel that they were being also used and misused by those in power? No, it is a structural thing. And it is a structural thing because even from the word go, the Nigeria police force deliberately selected those members of the police force that are the most violent, most vicious, and most reckless amongst them and deployed them to start. So it was a structural thing. They originally designed this team, and they said some robbers are ruthless, and therefore we should get the ruthless amongst us and deploy them there. And so they are originally selected ruthless, violent, most vicious members of the police force. Now, when they were deployed, I mean, I have had, uh, uh, you have had stories of people being stopped on the road to, uh, uh, for their phones to be searched, for their laptops to be searched. And once you carry a flashy phone, maybe iPhone uh, 11 or iPhone uh, uh, 10, or you, I mean, carry a laptop that is big or even drive a flashy car or have a hairstyle, you have committed an offense. I don't know where they got that law from. I don't know when carrying a laptop or a laptop bag became a crime in Nigeria. But then from that point, they would detain you and try to extort you. If you play by their rules, which is giving them what they want, fine. Otherwise, you might end up being a cop. They would kill you right there and then, and they would confidently say nothing would happen to us by killing this man. So this is one story. But understand that it is bigger than that. SARS, in all the offices, uh, there are offices all over Nigeria in the uh, states of Nigeria, have a torture chamber where they keep young people who are reported either for armed robbery or for other kinds of offenses or even for domestic disputes and contractual uh, uh, disagreements. Mm -hmm. What they do is use those torture chambers where people are electrocuted where they use, um, uh, I mean, groves that eat into people's uh, skin, where they, they, they use horrible things to torture Nigerians. So it's a structural thing. And because the chambers are in the police uh, headquarters of each state, you know that the police officers, every commissioner of police in the state knows that this chamber exists. Mm. 
Now, that's not enough. If you want your debt collected, debt collectors, if you pay them, they will total your creditor to pay you. Wow. If a woman or a man wants to give uh, a divorce from their spouse and the spouse doesn't give a divorce, pay us. They will torture the other party to give a divorce. If you have a, uh, I mean, a, a contract that hasn't been in, in, enforced and you don't want to go to a court because it will waste time, mm. you have money, you are connected to a member of SAS, report to them and they will torture that man until he, uh, they, uh, I mean, they comply with the contract or they die. And I tell you this as someone who has prosecuted each of these cases. I have prosecuted each of these cases against us. And if we have time, I will give you specific stories of individuals that went into a contract and they ended up in such office that, uh, I mean, had to divorce their wives because such has tortured them and all that. So it's more endemic, it's a systemically, but it's also a mentality. Mm -hmm. And therefore, disbanding the the unit itself isn't enough. We need to go further, and perhaps this is something we might talk about if we have time. Um, Blama, we saw that um, the protests, by many standards, or many would say that this brought some kind of result. It got into the ears of the federal government in a way that it probably ever ha hasn't. It has never uh, in this manner whereby, sure, in the past, promises would have been made, all right, we look into it. But then we saw this announcement come last night and say, okay, we're going to go ahead and dissolve. Would you say that the, the events of this last week then gave rise to this, that it is because of the protests that you had President Buhari together with the IG of police now saying, okay, this has become too much. Were they responding to the protest or responding to the fact that SARS has actually become terrible. What were they responding to by this action? No question about that. They were responding to the protest, mm. and it tells you how powerful protest can be. Uh, they saw Nigerians on the streets. Initially, if you, uh, I mean, for those who followed, the police started using lethal force against uh, peaceful protesters, not carrying anything except the Nigerian flag, people who were only carrying their water, uh, which they drank at the protest, People who were very peaceful, very civil, just chanting and such. They started using lethal force, using hot water, using tear gas, using live bullets, and they killed some uh, protesters even in the last few days. Mm -hmm. Now, Nigerians withstood that. We defied that. We said, look, you can't scare us back because we know even if we don't protest, you will continue to kill us. So kill as many as you want to kill, but we will continue to protest and we will continue to expose you to the world. Mm. And President Buhari saw the protests in London. He saw the protests in Washington. He saw the protests in Abu Dhabi reported in Kenya, in Washington, in the US, I mean, in the UK, in other places of the world. And you know, African politicians, I don't know, I don't want to generalize, but Nigerian politicians in, uh, in particular do not fear anything more than the international community and bad image with them mm. because they are their lenders. They are uh, the people they run to when they, 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 they need money. And when they are sick, it is the foreign hospitals they go to. You, and they don't grant you visa, you are in trouble. Mm -hmm. You and your family, because they also educate their children outside the country. And because they saw the protest giving them this negative image and exposing them to the world, now they had to respond. It is a great, uh, an incredible accomplishment and it is an indication for, to Nigerians and other Africans that civil disobedience, non-violent civil disobedience works. And we must ensure that we hold our leaders accountable mm. through the press. If, if they don't listen through the press, through our advocacy, then let's pour out on the street without violence, without destroying property, because it is our property. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I and ask send this? the message as strongly as possible as Nigerians did this time around. B President Buhari, the Inspector General of Police, and others wouldn't have listened to us if we did not protest. And if we had left this protest in the first two or three days, if we had got tired, they wouldn't have listened to us. They just understood that we were determined to continue, and that's why they had to bow down to, to pressure. They had to, I mean, swallow the pie and give Nigerians what they wanted. If we removed the corrupt element from 
this police uh, unit, that is, of course, uh, uh, academically speaking, would you say that such a force is still needed within Nigeria? No. Uh, it, it, it's a force that has outlived its relevance. And uh, there are several reasons. Number one, as I said in the beginning, SARS was initially set up to, to fight armed robbery when, uh, in its heyday. Mm -hmm. Now, thanks to mobile banking, nobody goes about with cash. In Nigeria, I don't know for Kenya, I will assume, mm -hmm. mobile banking in Kenya is also so advanced that people don't go about with cash anymore. And therefore, armed robbers has no, have nothing to rob on the highways. Mm -hmm. yep. And so the crime of armed robbery has formed into different other crimes, like kidnapping. People are being kidnapped uh, for ransom or cattle like or other forms of crime like banditry, what, what we call banditry in, in Nigeria, mm -hmm. most of which takes uh, place in the on the highways and in rural areas. And as I speak to you, as police are killing innocent Nigerians on the streets of Abuja and Ogomosho and other places yesterday and day before yesterday, kidnappers and armed robbers have been uh, wreaking havoc in other parts of the country. And so there are no armed robbers. So, I mean, oh, armed robbers have changed into something else. And therefore, what you need is anti-kidnapping squad. What you need is anti-banditry squad. What you need is anti Boko Haram squad because mm. you have a violent extremist group in the Northeast killing Nigerians, thousands of Nigerians per year. And therefore, those members, I mean, the whole unit uh, has outlived its relevance. It has run its course. And therefore, it is good time for it to go so that they may focus on other crimes that have, uh, that, that have uh, emerged in the country in, uh, since the uh, SARS was formed. Just looking back at how you um, described their operations um, in every part yes. of, of uh, the country where there's police head, the headquarters, there'd be some torture chambers, and uh, they're basically operating like they're a force and, uh, you, you know, a force unto themselves. Do you feel as if they'd gotten to a point where they were even superior to their superiors? Where if you come in, you're a local com uh, commissioner of police in a local state, you are basically answerable to this unit as opposed to the other way around. I mean, definitely. I mean, you are a very smart and intelligent uh, person, I must say, John. I mean, is that John? Oh, Eric. 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 Oh, Eric. And I say you are very smart and intelligent because that, uh, I mean, such commissioners of police are not, uh, I mean, such is not answerable to local commissioners of police, even in its setup, even in the policy. Because such such is a federal unit, and it is answerable only to the Inspector General of Police. And I have had live cases in places like Kano, where I have cases with SARS, and I would report it to the Commissioner of Police, Kano Command, and he would say, this fault is not under me, they are not answerable to me, they are not responsible to me, and I can't stop them. And so the only way is for you to go to Abuja. Mm -hmm. So even by its original set of SARS, it's above commissioners of police. Mm -hmm. They are directly under the inspector general of police. And when it came to the issue of being, uh, I mean, practicalities, if you leave the policy aside, SARS then became a force that, that, that's the only force that is directly under the commissioner. So the head of SARS in the state has the, the ear of the Inspector General of Police in Abuja more than the Commissioner of Police does. And therefore, they became low, the law unto themselves, not only against innocent Nigerians, but also against their own superiors in the, uh, in the police chain. Hmm. Now, with what we see now, I mean, we saw a week of protests. We saw this announcement yesterday. And we saw from the same IG of police, I think there were five points now that they're trying to now um, go through with um, f going forward. What are we seeing? Because from, we, from what we understand, there's still some protests happening around the country, even today, and people have not let down. What more do you expect to see from the government um, you can dissolve the, the, the squad, that's all right, which is a good thing. But what more needs to be done in order to see that this actually has lived through its, its lifespan properly? Yeah, so um, as I said in the beginning, SAT is not just a unit, it is a mentality. 
And like I told you, every member of that unit was deliberately selected for being vicious, for being reckless, for being violent. And I can tell you that is from the bottom of the chain to the uh, topmost end of the chain. And I tell you this as someone who has prosecuted cases against the national head of the unit. Hmm. And I prosecuted cases against him because he killed an innocent Nigerian in Kano. And by a court judgment, the court held that the, uh, the, the disease died as a result of the torture he received at, in their hands. Mm -hmm. And it ordered compensation against him and other officers. It ordered that he should be investigated and prosecuted and that the police should publicly apologize to the family. Mm -hmm. And I, I speak to you today, none of these orders have been carried out. Mm -hmm. I mean, to make matters worse, instead of prosecuting this man, he was promoted from Kano, where he killed this 24-year-old Nigerian, to become the head of such a task in Abuja. And as we speak today, he is in the inner cycle of the, uh, of the Inspector General of Police. So what am I saying? Now, SAS has been disbanded. The next thing we want to see is a swift and transparent investigation and prosecution of each and every member of SARS that is guilty of human rights abuses, including extrajudicial killing. Mm. That is something that must be done transparently. We don't no inquiry that is done in private or inside police, uh, I mean, police headquarters mm. would be acceptable to us. We want independent, transparent, swift investigation and prosecution of all of them that are guilty of human rights abuses. Number, th number three, we want to immediately see other members of SARS against whom there are no uh, established cases of human rights abuses to be screened by psychologists and psychiatrists and, me uh, and mental health doctors. Mm. Because, it, I mean, there is a good chance that every member has been infected by the virus of brutality in that unit. And therefore, we want to ensure that only members of the, that unit that are medically uh, certified to be healthy are deployed to other units of the Nigeria Police Force. And we want to see holistic, holistic reform in the Nigeria Police Force. As it is today, the Nigeria Police Force in the 21st century investigates cyber crimes by stopping Nigerians on the road to mm. search their port. Mm. <laughs> I mean, How on earth can you investigate <laughs> cyber crime by touching phones on the mm, mm, mm. How can you do that? The Nigeria, the average Nigeria police uh, policeman in Nigeria sees himself as someone that is above the law. The law that created him, the law that gave him the uniform and the gun he's yeah. brandishing uh, and going about with, the, the the gun that was bought with with our own money. The very law that establishes him, he feels he's above it. Right. And therefore, we need holistic reform for the police to understand that they are also uh, answerable to the public, but also under the law they are enforcing. And also, I mean, just moral, uh, I mean, training and uh, courses and educational programs that will upgrade the moral and educational standard of the average police officer in Nigeria so that he knows that he is serving the public and he is there to stand for the people, not against the people. Those are very good points that you're raising there. We want to look at what your demands are, the possibility and probability of achieving those demands, and maybe what timeline you're even giving those demands to for them to come to reality. We are speaking with Bulama Bukati. He is a human rights lawyer and a lecturer of law at Bayero University in Kano, Nigeria. He is among those who have been in the forefront of the demonstrations against the police unit in Nigeria called the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, and this is called SARS. So there have been these anti-SARS demonstrations uh, around the country. And yesterday, the federal national government uh, decided to listen to the demands of the people and they have now disbanded SARS, but the protesters are saying, that's not enough. We still want more. So we were trying to understand exactly what SARS has done to anger the people so much. In the room is Eric Latif, Ndu of course, CT Muga. On the line is Bulama Bukati, human rights lawyer from Nigeria, talking about protests that have borne fruit in this country. And these were protests against the special anti-robbery squad in Nigeria that had basically just run amok, gone rogue, doing all manner of things that were uh, against the tenets of human rights. And uh, Bulama has also told us he has personally prosecuted cases against this particular unit. Um, basically, this unit was 
running as if it's the only force that is in the country. Mm -hmm. But Bulama, you're saying even with this disbandment of the SARS unit by the, by the national government yesterday, you still are demanding more. And you've even gone as far as saying you even want psychiatric evaluation of each individual officer before they're redeployed to other units. Now, how many, un how many officers in total are we talking about? And when you talk about all these now other extra demands, what kind of timeline are you giving it? Yeah, so we are talking about uh, dozens of officers in each state, and we have uh, 36 states uh, of the Federation. And because of lack of transparency uh, in the police system, we don't know their total number, but I would assume they are in the hundreds. Now, um, the, the timeline when it comes to investigation is immediate. The president has announced, the inspector general of police has announced that they are commit, uh, uh, commissioning an investigation. And what, what we want is a transparent, independent uh, judicial commission of inquiry that must start within this month. We are 20, I mean, 10 days into this month or so. And what we want to see is investigating, taking uh, speed within this month. And then after the investigation, you know who are culpable <clears throat> and therefore would go to court of law, excuse me. And then if there are any members who are not culpable, because there will be very few of them, and then those that uh, should go through psychiatric evaluation, while those that are found uh, wanting by the investigation team uh, go to the, uh, through the criminal court process. Now, one other demand that uh, I forgot to mention is adequate comp compensation for victims. For victim, I mean, disease victims who are most, uh, their families must be com compensated, and for those who have been injured, maimed, or uh, rendered disabled by SARS, they are, I mean, they must be adequately compensated by the government. And we hold the government directly and vicariously responsible for that because SARS is working with their authority and under their power. And so this demand must start immediately. And we will continue to monitor them. And I can tell you, Nigerians will pour out back to the street if we see anything that is untoward uh, regarding our demands. If they don't meet any of our demands, we are going to go back on the street. As you know, protests are continuing even today. Mm -hmm. And that's because we have seen too many pronouncements of reforming SARS. The government had promised to reform SARS three, I mean, four times in the last four years, but they didn't reform now that they said we are disbanding them, we won't let our guards, we won't hold our breath until we see it uh, actually uh, disbanded in practice. Mm -hmm. We want to stop seeing their officers on the road. We want their uh, ch torture chambers to be closed down, and we want to hold them to be erased from the Nigeria police structure. And that's immediate. And then you have the commission of inquiry that must be led by credible and questionable Nigerians, mm. and then others like the psychiatric evaluation would follow. Mm. You mentioned something about compensation. Do we have any circumstances or situations where the government has been... Sorry, I can't hear you. For when any wrong has been committed uh, against uh, uh, an, uh, an ordinary citizen? <coughs> Sorry, could you come back again? I, yes, I, I, I can. A few seconds. It's all right. I, you mentioned uh, about seeking compensation, and I'm asking, uh, historically speaking, uh, are there situations in which the government has actually been known to pay compensations for ills that have been committed by some arm of government against an ordinary citizen? Yeah, there are. Uh, of course, you will have to go extra mile to get it uh, paid. But I have done several cases in which the uh, government had been uh, asked to pay compensation. In some, they have uh, paid after we have uh, taken the process out. But in the case of SARS, many have been, been paid. And I'll give you examples. Yes. There was a case I did in Jigawa where members of the police force invaded the house of a particular citizen. And uh, uh, for political reasons, because they were triggered by the governor to do that, that man was contesting uh, in the opposition party, and therefore his house was invaded. Mm -hmm. There was a compensation of 10 million naira, which is about um, uh, maybe 25,000 uh, pounds, uh, that was awarded by the court. The government did not pay, but I took out what we call Gandhi proceeding, which is attaching the money in the account of that individual or the government he was heading. 
and therefore we got the money paid. But in the case of staff, in 2014, I got a 10 million naira judgment against members of staff for killing a, Kano, uh, a citizen of Nigeria in Kano. And they did not pay. We took out garnishing proceedings and the court garnished their, their, their account. But then we couldn't proceed because they have refused to pay. And when, when the, uh, the, the account holder refuses to pay, you need the police to enforce it. And this time around, we are moving against the police. And it is like asking a thief to investigate and prosecute himself. Mm. Yep. And so it didn't go on. And so uh, there are instances in which courts have ordered, the orders have been complied with. And I just gave you one example, but there are many others I have personally prosecuted. But there are others in which the court have ordered, but governments haven't paid. And so uh, those kinds of cases are also there. Mm. Why do you think things happened in the way that they did this time around, Bulama? I mean, we had everybody on the streets. You had young people, older people. You had an outpouring of celebrities this time. I listened to you. And it seems that this fight, you've been carrying a lot of it on your shoulders, of course, with other um, human rights and advocates and practitioners. But it seemed that this time with this protest, it seems that this fever that had hit everybody hit in a way that it had never hit before. Why do you think that is? And you talked also about the importance of protesting. Why is it important for people who would not necessarily have anything to do with things like this in terms of their trade? Why is it important for them to come along? I mean, uh, several questions there, but I will unpack and uh, um, address some of them. Uh, the first is, why is it uh, uh, this, 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 can, uh, this way, this time around? Mm. And as you said, this, uh, I mean, I will mention three things. The first is that these are taking years of relentless advocacy. Mm -hmm. I have been moving against us, speaking against us in the Nigerian media, uh, for more than five years now. Mm -hmm. And I have personally also been threatened by them. My family has been threatened by them because they have gone wrong. They have made plans to kill me. But, you know, when you are doing it for the sake of the people, for God's sake, God will uh, bring people that will save you. Mm -hmm. And that was how God put someone in the sun's rug uh, to, 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 I mean, to, to love me and to like me and he would give me information on their meetings, on their plans and their schemes against me and my family. Now, that's, I mean, only what, I mean, it's not only me, but other uh, human rights advocates, human rights lawyers and media activists in Nigeria have also continued to advocate uh, for the end of that. So this is accumulated years of advocacy and anger and outcry that was caused by such impunity. Mm. That's the first thing. The second thing is social media. Nigerians very effectively use uh, social media. They uh, use Twitter, Facebook, and other social media outlets very well. Uh, we use the MSAT um, uh, now uh, hashtag, which trended worldwide as the first uh, yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, and also one of the best yesterday, and with millions of uh, tweets under that. Now, social media was a big part of that, and that's to tell you that people may use social media for bad things, but we can use it to promote democracy, to promote transparency, accountability, and hold our leaders to account, mm. especially in Africa, mm. where our institutions are weak, where our presidents have turned our institutions into their private uh, own, uh, ownership. Now, the third thing I would mention is something I have mentioned, uh, I have um, alluded to, which is the experience of every Nigerian. No Nigerian needs to be told that that is brutal because he has seen it on himself mm. or she has seen it with her family or a neighbor or at least someone they know. And so this is, uh, I mean, years of uh, all these things. But as to the question uh, as to the, why other citizens should take interest in matters that don't it directly affect them, the first thing I would mention is that we should be our brother's keepers. We don't need to be uh, personally uh, uh, affected by a particular injustice bec before we feel that it is injustice. Because injustice one is injustice to all. And if you, if, if as a human being, you only live for yourself and things that affect you, 
then you are not better than an animal. Mm -hmm. You are not better than a, a, a domestic animal that only eat and fend for themselves. Now, uh, and so it's important for us to understand that impunity, even if it happens to others, affect you. Mm -hmm. Number one, because you are a member of the human family, but also because if you allow people to continue to, to act with impunity, at the end of the day, you may also be affected because that will em embolden them to do even more. So, Bulama, you're talking about, um, you know, demanding all this and wanting an independent judicial inquiry to look into individual officers who've served in SARS over the years. Then one would expect that you as the, uh, the civil society and other protesters would be piling up a case against the individual SARS officers. Is this something that you're doing? For example, putting up a case, uh, going for victims and getting the victims to record statements, lining up the victims so that in case this uh, judicial inquiry commences, you already have people who would come and testify against the officers. Definitely, uh, we are doing that. And we have done that before. I have uh, told you of cases we have done in court against individual members of SARS. Mm. But I am already in contact with some of my clients, and I tell you all the cases I did, I, I did against us are cases I did pro bono. They are free because as a lawyer, I see my first job as defending the community, defending the society, standing for those that can't stand for themselves, being a voice for those who are voiceless in our community. Yeah. Because there are many people that haven't been privileged to be educated. And as human beings, we were educated, I mean, we got educated uh, by sheer privilege, and therefore we have a duty and responsibility towards that that aren't educated, towards that that uh, uh, those that don't have uh, uh, that that can't afford the services of lawyers uh, in uh, in our midst. Yeah. Now, I know that other lawyers are also doing the same. Other lawyers around the country also have clients. Some have uh, uh, can pay, and therefore they are paying. Others can't pay, and therefore uh, they might have uh, pro bono cases that will go before the, uh, I mean, uh, that will be presented before the commission, uh, Judicial Commission of Inquiry. Mm -hmm. And if the Judicial Commission of Inquiry does not give us what we want, if they don't, uh, I mean, abide by the law and the facts before them, then we will go to courts of law. We will prosecute cases against uh, members, individuals, members, individual members of SARS before courts of law, and take proceedings of mandamus to 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 compel the attorney general to bring uh, criminal actions against them. Mm. All these are things uh, on the table, mm. and I can tell you, nothing is uh, no option is off the table. This is a fight we are determined to keep going, yeah. and we are determined to keep that going with everything we have. I think you have your work cut out for you, but also this is a very good cause that you've taken, Bulamut, and we want to thank you very much. As we conclude this conversation, we have had many protests against uh, various police units in this country, police brutality. Looking at the uh, lessons that you have picked up from your own protests in the country, what would you like to advise those who are social justice campaigners in this country who would like also to see action taken against either individual police officers or specific police units? The first advice is for them to keep, to keep going. It is a challenging task. Mm -hmm. It is very demanding. And sometimes there are even personal sacrifices. Sometimes you, uh, some people pay the supreme sacrifice. But what it needs is the determination and doggedness to continue. Because the oppressor would always continue to use every force within their reach to ensure that they, uh, they weaken those uh, calling for justice and accountability. So my first advice is keep moving. Number two, plan, organize, and uh, implement your plan. Understand that this is not something that is individual. There is no need for one person to say, I am taking the credit. This is a movement. It is something that is credulous. It is a thankless job. You don't need to be the leader, and the leaders should understand that others should be given an opportunity to be at the forefront because this is not a fight for ego. This is not uh, something personal. It is a movement that must be kept going. Number three, people will understand that, uh, should understand, uh, campaigners should understand that there will always be challenges, but there will be light at the end of the tunnel, and that's what we saw in Nigeria.
We have seen a lot of operation in Nigeria. You might have seen a lot in Kenya. Uh, others in other parts of the world might have seen a lot, but we have to keep going. Mm -hmm. Civil rights activists all over the world have been fighting for ages. They have succeeded in some aspects, and there are aspects that are still, uh, uh, I mean, left, uh, th th that there are things that are left to be desired. Yep. And we just have to keep pushing. We have to keep going. Understand that the operator will not uh, uh, give you what you want on a platter of gold. Mm. Keep moving, keep peaceful, organize, plan, implement your plan, stand united, never allow politicians to polarize you. Because they are very good at disuniting people. They are very good at throwing money in your ranks mm. so that those of us that are corrupt might take it and then uh, become part of them. Keep moving and posterity would remember you. God will reward you for what you are doing. Asante sana. Thank you very much for speaking to us and have a great day in uh, Kano today. Yeah, thank you very much. And I must say, Spice FM is the best FM station I have been associated with. And I have, I have been associated with many. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, bye for now. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, sir.